Well, here we are, switching some things around. Uh, hello, welcome, my name is Mark. This is Perf Bits. It's been a little bit of a while since I've uh, gone live. There's been some things happening in the world. I took a trip, my niece got married. Uh, that was very cool. Um, it was a beautiful ceremony, to be honest with you, at my, at my, at my brother-in-law and sister-in-law's at their farm in Vermont. Um, the, it's, I guess it's not quite the, the sap running time, but they have like maple syrup there. So if you need a hookup for the maple syrup, let me know. I'm good for that. Uh, but, uh, welcome once again to uh, a little weekly wrap up. I am going to share some really cool stuff today about all the really fun toys that I get to play with. Um, and, uh, but the real topic is visualization and load testing performance visualizations. I'll talk a little bit about the origins of where I learned how to make sense of performance tests in real time and why that's important. But I want to give our shout outs to the various vendors, uh, I would say vendors, the great organizations that support Perfbytes, uh, generally catch point APM. And of course, web page test, um, still a fantastic tool for digital experience management and doing uh, application performance management. If you're not monitoring your stuff, you should monitor your stuff and you should do some observability things and some tracing things and some very cool things. Um, and particularly if you are a peer cloud deployment of the web, check out Catchpoint APM web page test. There's a great old tool that everyone was uh, familiar with. So web page test and very good. Thank you for your support. Tricentis of course is an organization uh, that all sorts of people I didn't know work for Tricentis actually work for Tricentis. And there's people that worked at Neotis, uh, our partner in Neotis. There's a Neotis PAC, Performance Advisory Council, coming up. Uh, I still have to figure out whether I can even go. I think it's next month, October. I don't think, I don't think I'm going to make it. I have a conflict, but uh, it's an amazing, it's been virtual. There's virtual PACs and real PACs. Uh, the Performance Advisory Council that Henrik started years ago, and we've all been part of in, in supporting that. So check out the Neotis pack. And of course, Flood.io was a sponsor uh, uh, of Perfbytes for many years. And, and check out the Tricentis offerings for performance, cloud-based performance, and of course, uh, Neoload if you're running locally. Um, Ryan Falk and Falk Consulting. Very, very cool. It's a good, great bunch of dudes. Really smart people. If you need professional services that are tool agnostic, and a lot about Perfbytes is kind of tool agnostic, we appreciate our, our sponsors, right? I mean, they're, they're awesome. But you know, we live in the world where everyone has every kind of tool that you could possibly imagine to use. Um, and so checking if you, I want this combination of this load testing tool, this APM tool, this profiling, this stack, all these different amount, they probably have an engineer that has worked with all of those tools and you could bring them in and say, all right, let me give you some pointers on how these specific tools are going to integrate and help you and make you be successful. Um, and some really, really smart professional services, folk consulting, Ryan, uh, the links are all below in the text down there, Ryan folk and folk consulting, check it out. Um, abstracta and a big announcement for the workshop on performance and reliability paper. I think you'd still send in a paper. I have to send in a paper. Uh, is in Uruguay, uh, in Montevideo, I think is the capital of Uruguay, and where Abstracta is, is located. They are hosting the workshop on perf performance and reliability. We're very excited to actually make the trip, and I hope everything aligns in the universe so that I can go do that. Um, and uh, there are some folks out there who are writing their papers and get in your papers, and they want me to review their papers. Trisha, that's you. Uh, so you can do that, and I'm happy to review uh, your uh, experience report submissions to the workshop. If you want more information, it's performance-workshop.org. There's also, at the same time of that week in December, that workshop is at performance-workshop.org. Abstracta is putting together a community, kind of a one-day conference, which I believe I'm going to give a talk at. I don't know what exactly I'll give a talk on, but it'll be something completely disruptive and groundbreaking. And uh, mostly when I give talks, I like to be inspiring, right? I have a tremendous respect for how, how difficult it is to do these jobs in performance engineering, SRE. Uh, it's in, in incredibly com complex systems and you, it, it, I, I, I like to be inspiring in my, in my talk. So who knows what we'll get into 
Um, but it'll probably be around modern performance engineering or something like that, which would be very, the princi principles for modern testing and modern performance would be very good there. Uh, so that's a shout out. Scott Moore Consulting, I just saw a bunch of posts from Scott about the performance tour, wrapping up some stuff in Atlanta. Um, boy, that guy's prolific. SMC Journal, all these different, you should check that out. He's does some amazing things. It's pretty swell. And the videos, of course, are absolutely hilarious. Completely hilarious. Um, so shout out to Scott Moore, Scott Moore Consulting. On, if you're on LinkedIn, if you're watching on LinkedIn, there you go. Exactly. Thank you, Paul Bruce. Paul Bruce on the horn uh, in the LinkedIn world right now. So Paul is LinkedIn. He's going to like, I'm going to go find the LinkedIn pages for all these people and I'm going to put them on this thread. Or not. It's Friday. It's after on the East Coast. It's almost six o'clock. You should be kicking back, maybe having a beer and relaxing before here in the North. A shout out to everyone in Florida who survived, hopefully survived. Uh, Hurricane Ian. Ian landed in Charleston, now headed up into South Carolina. So James Pulley there in South Carolina. Uh, and uh, ever, it's just coming up here to Philly this weekend. I don't know. It's, I, it's not, not good. So hope everyone is safe. Uh, best wishes to the hurricane folks. Of course, then like Puerto Rico got hit by Fiona and there, there was uh, uh, Cuba. I'm always... I'm always giving a shout out at some weird weather condition. I think it's because I sit here on a Friday and I can look at the weather out in my backyard. There it is. It's right over there. Who knows? Uh, I want to talk about performance visualization and I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, and the, the person I emulated as a product manager for Load Runner, which is Simon Berman, a fellow by the name. Look him up. If you're on LinkedIn, Paul's on LinkedIn. You can go look up Simon Berman. Uh, who was a product manager for Load Runner when I was simply a youngin? I was a Padawan of the of, of the Load Runner world, studying stuff. And it was the uh, the new Windows based controller when we went from just running stuff in Unix uh, or the in an in a in a, I forget what we what is it some kind of Motif GUI I think we were running in Motif three or something. We finally had a Windows based GUI. Uh, Controller, which was the controller that you know and love for many, many years, probably still to this day. Um, and at some point, it switched from just being the load testing tool. And I remember, I think I, I was on a beta or I got, there weren't really betas back then. The company was so small that it was like, hey, do you know anyone that wants to try this out? And I just happened to be one of those guys that was like, you want to try this out? And it was the online EXE, executable, which presented... I think there were four graphs and not much else in that beta. Just the idea that you could combine monitoring the load you were generating with information from the system under test coming back. Now I've covered this idea of, and for years, and even on this channel, monitoring the system under test that you're generating load on. So you don't just close your eyes and you know send a thousand transactions per second. You want to monitor that. But in particular, it was how you present that GUI, that how do we visualize what's happening in performance. And I want to give you three tips right off the top of my head. Um, what's a GUI? It's a GUI is like a duck. And there is, you're right, it is like a duck. Thank you, Paul. It is Friday. Um, the, uh, there's a, a two, no, there's three real tips I have. The first tip, I have for you, and I'm going to show you some examples of the stack I'm using and, and a shout out to the different folks that I'm using. And recently, I've switched a bunch of stuff over to K6 um, from JMeter to K6 just because it was time, secondarily. Who, I, I you know, just give up. I'm, I'm not a super Java guy, so we're going to try some K6. Um, anyway, the first tip I have for you is that I remember something about those four graphs in, in that tool that everything was based on elapsed time. So as time progressed from left to right, as almost all the tools visualize left to right, um, doesn't need to be left to right. You, if everyone, like there are different languages that go right to left, right? So you could go right to left. Um, but usually elapsed time from left to right in my mind. Um, and almost all the graphs are something happening over time. And so the J, the JMeter plugins have, you know, iterate transactions over time. 
uh, re response time over time. We're sort of doing a two by matrix, X, Y matrix on a graph where elapsed time over time is elapsed time. And the reason elapsed time, this is my guess. This is what I want to share with you. Elapsed time is incredibly important, not, not because nobody knows what time it is. And uh, not because we're not interested in what's happening on the system under test. It's, it's the when something is happening. And more often than not, now that everything is in a web-based interface, if you're in Catchpoint or Dynatrace or even the load testing tools, there's some kind of web interface that gets launched so that remote parties, we had this in Performance Center too, remote parties can attach and see what's happening in the load. Or I don't really have access to your little fancy load tool over there, Mark. So I'm going to look in my tool and you have this idea of I generated load at some specific time. So when did something happen is I swear to God, 90% of the questions that fly back and forth, trying to figure out what went wrong. Where did something slow down? It's, well, can you tell me when? When did you run that? When did that happen? Oh, it was the night. And you go from, it happened, it was in yesterday's run. Oh, it was yesterday's run at two o'clock. It was exactly at 2.03. And then someone will get like 2.03 and 37 seconds, uh, 36 seconds. Okay. So there are people that would get that specific when triaging a problem as you're narrowing and, you know, finding a needle in a haystack. So, if all of your graphs, one of the, every tool that I think I see succeeding and excelling in this work has two characteristics. Almost all the graphs by default are over time, elapsed time, and they zoom in and out really well. And I want to show you what I mean. I'm going to, I hope this works if I go there and you're seeing uh, seeing my influx instance, and I, I don't know if I can, this is, this is, yeah, that's working. Right. All right. So if I'm looking at influx and this is, this is uh, an influx database instance running on a, uh, I think a little VM, um, on ESX running in our, in our cluster of stuff. And so it's, it's not tremendous, but I, I'm running 500. If you add the blue and the yellow, there, shout out to Ukraine, Ukraine colors in all of our graphs. Um, 500, it's about a thousand transactions per second humming along there and reasonable response, reasonable under this load for this system that I'm testing is, you know, f between four and five seconds, two, two to five seconds kind of response time. So it's, I mean, it's putting some load on the system, which is great. Uh, but the idea that I can zoom in and out and look at everything over time Here's a collection of, again, four, I'm a four graphs kind of guy, which, thank you, Simon Berman. Like, you got me hooked on, all you really need are four graphs. What are your virtual users doing? How many of them are active? And if I backed up, you'd see we ramp up to some amount. Um, and how much load are you creating? And then really, response time and errors, is it a, cl is it a clean run? Like, is everything running smooth? Well, there aren't any errors, and, but the response time's slow. So it's slow, but I'm getting 200s. Perfect example. Like those four graphs are the most common things that I would get asked about a load test. Oh, how much load did you run? Uh, I was running about 1,000 transactions per second. Okay. Um, and if somebody knew what virtual users were, if they cared, they'd be like, oh, what's up? what's a virtual user for, you know? So you'd say, how many virtual users are you running, blah, blah, blah. But really, I was seeing this response time degradation. Why are you seeing it? Well, when did you see it? Well, that's where the zooming comes in. And I have always enjoyed a little uh, Grafana influx in all of this stuff. Uh, Dynatrace is another tool that does this really well. If I've got multiple different tests that I'm running, I can zoom in and out. Oh, what are these little gaps in here? That's interesting. Yeah, let's go look at some of these gaps. What was happening at 1739 and 1739 1739 12 to 1739 40. That's interesting. There's this kind of a looks like some kind of a gap happening in whatever that blue transaction was. But I can zoom in and out really smoothly, really nicely, right? I I I think that is incredibly important to zoom in and out cuz that's what we're doing in in root cause analysis. We're zooming in and zooming out to things. So the first, the first concept uh, 
that I like seeing within my visualization for stuff is the ability then to take a screenshot of this and send it. So I could like take this right now here. I'll, I'm going to do this right now just because Paul's on the line. I'm going to take a copy of this. I'm going to come over here just for a second, save it to the clipboard. All right, here I go. And uh, I'm going to go into LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm going to go into LinkedIn and I'm going to find the, the live stream. Here we go. Log in to LinkedIn. There we go. And somewhere I think I'm, I'm live. I have to find myself. There we go. Live virtualization. I'm going to go to the thread and put in a comment and I'm going to add, come on. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't want me to. Yeah. It wants me to do it as a picture. Hang on. I gotta go. I've got to grab a picture. This is very exciting. So, right. I have to say, if I have not ever, if you've ever been on a gig with me, uh, and you see that I absolutely love uh, sending screenshots to people. There you go. Post done. Ha ha. There it is. Isn't that fantastic? I think that's totally fun. Uh, so let me go back over here to campfire. So that was, I was showing you that. Um, elapsed time, the ability, the elapsed time and the ability to zoom in and out. Uh, and then of course, take a screenshot to say, here's exactly what I'm seeing at some specific time. Um, that's like super important, super valuable to help people get in on that. Um, the, uh, the next thing, uh, in visualization, I'm going to go to that next, um, call Bruce is asking, Bruce is actually asking something. Uh, what is a proxy? When is a proxy for why? Oh, no, I like this statement. Sorry, I, I, my eyes are not there. When is a proxy for why? Mm, no, it's a transfer. It's a it's a transformative proxy, meaning if I tell you when you are missing a piece of your puzzle in your investigation, Columbo, uh, where you're like, well, now tell me again what was happening for a few seconds before you walked into the dry cleaners, Mr. Johnson. Ah, exactly. Columbo's onto it, smoking a cigar. Um, and that's the idea. But uh, so I agree. It is a proxy for why. It's more like a, um, why something happened. It's missing pieces of the puzzle. Who done it? Basically. I like, I always like the mystery part of that. Um, yeah, fantastic. But two things to keep in mind about when is time zones. Like if I'm in this GUI right here, it shows me 1735. I send that screenshot across to LinkedIn world. Maybe you're in a different time zone. Well, did I communicate what time zone did I take in that? You'll see some people are really smart about this where it'll actually be either be in the test tool in the corner as to what time zone they're in, or when you take a screenshot, you actually take a screenshot with uh, the time zone exposed on your operating system in the corner, if you can actually print that out. So letting me, if you're collaborating with teams in different time zones, you have to figure out, Hey, don't forget to communicate. I'm in Eastern, Eastern standard time zone or daylight time savings. The second thing, um, you'll want to, uh, let people know is that if from elapsed time, you can obviously zoom in and zoom out. If you're having a conversation with somebody about the big time frame and you send them a link to a really, really small slice of something, you, Try to be intuitive, try to intuit where, whether they're asking for more context about what's happening around the, the, one of these spikes here's these interesting spikes that are happening in this tool. Um, and I'm blowing it up on this is a small system that I'm hitting with a massive amount of load. Uh, but you get the idea, right? So if, if someone's asking a big question, I should help them see the big picture. If they're asking to zoom in, I should zoom in and help them get more detailed about the specific question they have. So elapsed time, very, very important. Um, the other visualization technique that uh, I think is really, really, really important is consistent coloring. And this is something I will give a shout out that load runner always did really well. Um, and I think still does really well. Grafana does an incredibly job of this, a good job of this, which is here. I can change the colors, the color scheme of something. Uh, so these auths or this, whatever it is, if I can change the color into a standard set of colors, and of course I have colors, so I'm kind of a color, we react to colors and things like that. 
So keeping them consistent, where I have the color of this particular transaction in the throughput is colored the same as related transactions in response time. So you use the same color between those two different things. If something's bad, it's usually red. I, I think it's like stop, like stop signs are for a universally some kind of amber or red color. Um, and you can look up that universal uh, uh, kind of stuff like that, which is cool. The other one that I will tell you that I, I have habits on stuff. Um, if I look in Dynatrace uh, at like a stacked layer break, what these call layer breakdown, there will be certain colors of certain kinds of activity, certain kinds of traffic that were always the same. Once, like I, you could run the same test for the for a year. And I could go back and find a screenshot and look at one of those test runs and go, all right, green is logging, orange is class loading, you know, this other blue, this, you know, purple is something else. And I would be able to see if something changed on that test run just by the, the gradients, like the color changes in the stack. Color is incredibly important. Um, and try to, try to stick with them consistently. One of the things that I don't like from a, uh, from a Grafana standpoint, um, although I think there's ways to, to fix this, I just haven't done it, so I'm not really knocking it, is that if there are transient values that enter into the query, so filtering your queries is really important, um, you'll get, it, it'll bump all the colors out of whack and then like for that graph it's run and then it returns. So there, at least it makes things look weird. But being consistent in your coloring I think is really, really important um, when you're communicating it. The other thing is, this is a real-time tool. You, remember, you also probably have offline reporting. Like if, you, if you're doing a more formal uh, validation of performance, you'll want to make sure that the tool, the reports kind of reflect the same graphs and keep in mind reports are usually not in dark mode like the things we see in front of you like these like the cool everything kind of got cool in dark mode even jmeter has dark mode uh run deck dark mode dark mode is cool also because it's good for our eyes try to be conscientious of that when you put it in a report format if for some reason that report ends up in a powerpoint deck it ends up being printed potentially if it's that formal, you might be in that formal a situation. You might not have dark screenshots. So be a little cognizant of that because I have to tell you, if you're communicating the value and the importance and the respect for doing your job, doing this work, take a little bit of care about communicating that value in, your, in the coloring and do, and make, figure out, just get whatever tool you're using. Uh, study how they use colors and they communicate their results in the graphs. Like I have a little more homework to do, I think, really uh, handling, I do a lot, I, I've lately been just doing all sorts of weird different tests and the Grafana colors have been giving me uh, all kinds of heck. So I'm gonna spend some time figuring out how to roll a dashboard that has really consistent coloring in Grafana. Um, and if you have thoughts on that, just go ahead and put them in the comments below. It's really great. Um, so the third thing I have about visualizations, particularly around real time, is refresh rate. And this is something that anyone who's been monitoring any systems in production for a very long time, it's the frequency with which you are going to go out to the system under test, which includes going out to your load generator potentially, or having a, like a Prometheus uh, or Telegraph scrape information and put it back into a time series database or make it available in the plumbing of your online monitoring, the online, the old online EXE. So we always had concerns, especially we're talking 25 years ago or more, very anemic systems, low resource systems that if you like tried to query and do fre fre frequency sampling, every two seconds, every one second, less than one second, you would chew up 50% of the CPU just trying to get metrics off the box. We don't have to worry about that as much, but my tip for you about in 2022 about refresh rate is that if, if something sits, you've seen this picture sit right now, the entire time I'm talking to you in this little box in the corner, 
um, and my little box goes away, that kind of stuff. There you go. Um, it, I will lose interest. Like, what's happening here? Is anything changing? Like, we, in 2022, some 25 years later, everything moves. Everything's animated. Like, animation is off the charts in our technology. If we are so accustomed, something's happening, that I think there's a filter in the human brain, in our human perception, of the, in the way I perceive stuff. Because I've had people in the middle of load testing, like, have something that only refreshes once a minute or once every 15 seconds. And even that, they're like, uh, well, what's, what's happening here? Are we supposed to see this? It, it can almost drive some anxiety. I think it does drive a little anxiety, like we're doing load testing, we're blowing stuff up, or maybe you're even in a triage after some massive outage, like nerves are really high. So having a consistent refresh rate and also controlling for it, where you kind of have some standards, and a lot of mine are like standard, just look at the, here, I'll give you the last 15 minutes, should still be running. We'll see how it, yeah. Oh, it's hanging right in there, four or five seconds, very good. Um, but it's a very consistent, you can expect it to refresh every five seconds. Again, this is also something in real time, if you're working and collaborating with a group, you're, you're a ref, this is a reflection of your work, right? The ability that we can see these graphs in real time. It's not just sexy, fun, cool stuff. You, isn't this cool we can see this? Well, truth be told, the online EXE 25 years ago and the controller gave you real time kind of stuff. In fact, set load runner aside, we were looking at real time stuff in a R stat, uh, in an IO stat. I mean, we were looking at stuff refreshing in a top monitor on a Unix box decades ago. So be more conscientious of how people on your team who aren't used to seeing real-time information, there's a lot to take in. And if it keeps shifting and changing, you have some people you need to help. All right, let's just zoom in and look only at response time. So I'm just going to do refreshes that drive that conversation. It's like, okay, well, let's, let's go back now. And I'm going to, sorry, I may have to move my, my guy over here just so I can go back. So let's go back. Uh, to the other one and say, let's just particularly look at the throughput that we're going to look at and learn the shortcuts. Here's the shortcuts, right? Different V, different view stuff. So we can look just at the throughput. Like what are these little dips? There's some interesting little dips in here that might be database blocking. Uh, so let's have a conversation about database blocking. If I take uh, uh, talking about this refreshing at a certain rate, one of the things that I can notice at refreshing in, say, my Dynatrace dashboard, catch it point APM, you set sort of a default for refresh on some of the dashboards. If I'm going to right click and jump over to another tool, and I'm let's say I'm sharing my desktop in a in a in a Zoom call, um, I would like that other refresh rate to be similar. So you might be very conscientious when you're collaborating, especially virtually, because if you look at this screen, like this could be kind of intimidating if you're just, I see all these graphs moving and, and you and I know, performance engineers of the world know, not everyone knows what all these numbers mean, what all the metrics mean. And there are, can be hundreds and hundreds of them, thousands of them maybe. Um, and your job is to help people figure out the couple of metrics that are the most important. Um, so think about refresh rate as a way that you could lose your audience or lose attention um, also a way to synchronize and maintain their attention in a very conscientious, guided kind of way, um, which is pretty cool. I don't, I don't think I can, I can go back. I'll go back to this stuff. Um, for what you're seeing here, and I just want to give a shout out. Um, oops, I'll go back here. Um, I just want to give a shout out to a couple of the authors of these things. Um, the first off is, uh, is Paul, um, the Java ducky. Um, who did the K6 output Influx DB, and it it he built it for Influx DB version two, and there's an example dashboard that's in here under the samples. So I actually learned quite a bit from how he parses HTTP requests, uh, it, the HTTP request information from K6 that comes into uh, the so this is the extension you build extension for K6 you build the runtime. Uh, on the fly, a, a new version of the runtime to use um, in your Docker container, et cetera. But he has a lot of good information. Um, he's a prolific guy if you go look through all the repos. Um, so really fantastic stuff. Thank you 
to Paul for building this. I'm using it, um, but it's very lightweight. I'm not seeing anything massive and my influx DB uh, tuning works really, really well the way they have their values, the fields, values, tags, and indexes, well, indexes uh, working out for that. The other person I'll say is Henrik, uh, somewhere in here, I also have the output for Dynatrace, so a very similar set of output headed out to Dynatrace. But if you're not in K6, if you're a JMeter user, um, and you know, NeoLoad has these things built in, performance at a load runner, they have these things built in. JMeter for a long time has sort of system monitor built in, but it's been quite a number of years that that backend listener, you could go to JMeter and check out what metrics it exposes through the backend listener. And sure, there, there's a Dynatrace backend listener, there's an Influx backend listener. You can get JMeter to spit stuff out in real time. And even they've updated some stuff to work with Influx DB version two, which has been a big pain. Um, but also look for Prometheus. You've got Influx DB going native into Prometheus. So um, they similar kinds of graphs. Again, four or five graphs. Elapsed time really good. So if you haven't, if you haven't checked, if you're in the JMeter world, some of the other tools you can definitely jump on board um, and uh, and make those things work. You get like if you're in the cloud with the Flood IO stuff with JMeter. There may be other, they may already add in their backend listener, like you just upload your script and they take care of it, right? Because they're going to parse your, your JMX file, your source code anyway, to do that, um, which is pretty fantastic. All right, I'm going to go here and then I'm going to go there. Um, just to recap, thanks, Paul, for joining. Again, uh, again, three tips around visualization. One, elapsed time, being able to zoom in, zoom out, really, really important colors and being consistent with your coloring and being very conscientious about coloring and maybe not using dark mode in your reports. Very, very good. And the last thing is if you're refreshing not fast enough or refreshing too fast, there's all kinds of things to be aware of if you have a live collaborative, if you're doing mob, I'll call it mob or paired. If you've got an audience that's not very familiar with the metrics that you're refreshing, you want to maybe slow that refresh rate down so you can see stuff. If you find something really, in, I like the one thing I like about Grafana that's harder in some of the other tools. If I zoom in, it stops the refresh and just allows me to zoom in on that until I undo that and go back to watching the real time feed. Brilliant, uh, brilliant ideas um, on those two things. So those are my three tips and a little bit of demonstration. Again, shout out to Henrik and Paul uh, for their work. Um, I can do some more stuff with that dashboard if I come up with a generic version, I t still tell you for me, such a pain to convert all of the dashboards I have into that Influx DB version two uh, query syntax. But once you get to the groove, it works out, it gets easier. And then we're gonna move some stuff into the into Dynatrace. So that will be really, really fun. Um, check out the rest of the Perfpytes world. There's some stuff recently in Perfpytes Espanol and of course, Leandro and maybe Henrik. Maybe Henrik, I think. Uh, I don't I haven't heard from James yet, but a bunch of us are going to be in Uruguay at the workshop on performance and reliability. So if you want to come down and do some perf biting with us, perf beat, perf beat, perf biting. That's, that sounds right. Perf biting down in Uruguay. You can definitely come and join us. Check it out. Um, and and the Abstracta conference. They are still looking potentially for sponsors. So shout out to any of our supporters in the Perfbytes world as a company. If you're looking for performance specific avenues or channels or campaigns that you could do in South America, particularly in Uruguay, uh, check that out. Um, it's an opportunity. We get in touch with uh, uh, with Fede and and the guys at Abstract. They'll they'll get you connected. That would be really awesome. Um, there's also is it observable from Henrik over in the Dynatrace world, and you'll see. They did like, Henrik is now making his way into like the Dynatrace ask Q&A kind of thing. I saw he and Andy on one just recently was really good. So there's some some really cool content coming out from the Dynatrace world. Uh, for the, mostly a shout out to Henrik for producing that. But the Is It Observable concept is still just a fantastic show. If you're new to tracing and monitoring and observability, he does a great job of uh, just touring and, and he's so connected to all these things. Um, and as usual, good luck in all of your performance and load testing initiatives uh, around the world. If there's anything I can do to help you out, feel free to shoot me a message uh, on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever you, uh, you can find me. That would be fine. And I will endeavor to join you 
next Friday with something else interesting and hopefully valuable. Have a great weekend and uh, stay dry and stay safe. Thanks, folks. Ciao.